So this is a 44 year old dude that um, wrecked his motorcycle. And it was one of those deals where like somebody uh, like didn't see him and changed lanes and sort of smashed his leg into the side of his bike. I think it was a tra like a trailer being pulled behind a truck that hit him. So pretty good crush injury to the distal tibia. And if you look at this, you see there's also some pretty substantial foot and um, uh, hind foot trauma. You know, there, there's a dislocation, there's crush injury of the base of the metatarsals, um, there's a tail and navicular dislocation. Like it's totally crushed, everything's all smashed up. Um, if you look at the pilon, it's, it's um, kind of decimated. There, there's not really defined pieces. You've got a big chunk of the medial malleolus that's missing. Um, maybe it's out on the highway somewhere. There's a lot of comminution in the metadiaphyseal segment of the fracture, which that's going to be problematic. Like usually you can get a pilon joint to heal. It's the metadiaphyseal part that's problematic. Usually that's any non-union of the pilon that I treat, it's usually that portion. And these are the ones that have trouble where there's a lot of comminution in that segment. And then the fibula fracture is not very clean either. It's, it looks like it's in a few pieces. So this is a tough one. Um, and, the, and this is no stranger to trauma. They've, they've had some other visitations in the past with the minimalist, it looks like. Um, but another view there, you see that pretty extensive metadiaphyseal comminution. And, and the thing that's difficult for me about these types of pilon fractures is figuring out how, how the heck long the distal tibia is supposed to be and getting it right with the fibula. Because the mistakes that I've made is I've gone back and looked at these after, you know, a year after they're healed or whatever. And I, um, and, and I either shortened their tibia, so their fibula is, is a little bit long, or the other way around, the fibula is short. And so it's, it's dead even with the medial malleolus. And we know that that changes the joint mechanics pretty substantially. So may, maybe I doom those people to osteoarthritis a little sooner than later. So um, just a little look at the foot there. It's, it's trashed. And the point of this is not for us to sit around and talk about how would we fix those, those fractures and dislocations in the foot. It's just, this is a pretty severe crush injury. So this is a, this is a nasty animal that we're dealing with here. There's, this gives you a nice lateral view of the joint surface. So remarkably, the joint is actually fairly well spared in some places. And sometimes pilon fractures, you have, you have a lot of intraarticular involvement, but you've got one good slice of dome. And, and that's maybe what you're gonna hang your hat on. So if you have good, one good slice of dome that you can piece back together, um, you don't necessarily have to sit in the OR for eight hours trying to figure out how to put the entire tibial plafond back together again because it might be impossible. You might, you might just end up with something like this. So um, CT scan, again, the, um, you've got that posterior lateral split that James pointed out in his last case wasn't displaced. In this case, it is displaced. And then look again at the shortening. So if you look at that posterior fragment of the distal tibia and follow the cortex up to the top, and then you look at the cortex of the bone in front of it, that's like at least a centimeter. And that's supposed to be all the way down there. So that's a lot of shortening. And how the hell do you reduce that? That's hard. Like that's really tough to get that pulled back down where it belongs. That to me is what's hard about fixing a pilon. Not putting those two pieces together that anybody can do that. It's, the, it's getting the length. And then if you look at the CT scan on the right, the medial malleolus is totally dusted, but you've got some nice articular surface in the middle segment. So maybe, maybe this pilon fracture, the problem is more gonna be the soft tissue, Never mind the foot. We know the foot's crap, but maybe the problem here is gonna be the soft tissue more than the, the articular fracture and then the length. So um, this was one that somebody sent to me. So it came in, in this um, Delta frame. They did at least control the forefoot, which was nice, but I, I probably would have put a Taylor neck pin in this one for sure had it, had it been on my night. So here's the real problem is that there's a giant hole immediately. So you see exposed tendon, you see exposed bone. This is definitely gonna need a free flap, um, washouts, all that jazz. So now this automatically should be changing your mind about how you want to fix these. And 
And some of us who have access to really great plastic surgeons, um, I myself um, ha have a couple of really great guys that can flap this right away with really good success. But that still doesn't mean you should do whatever you want to do. You still are going to create problems if you put too much metal in there. And, and I learned early on that just thinking they can slap meat on, on it and make it fine is not really a, a good methodology. They still have a higher incidence of infection. If you've got a bunch of metal underneath it there, you've got a freaking flap you got to lift up every time to deal with it. You run the risk of killing the flap if it's early in its life cycle. So um, I, I try to be a minimalist as much as possible. And since this is a pushing the envelope course, I, I'm going to show you guys something that's a little bit weird. It's a little bit out there and it's probably not for everybody, but for me, it works pretty nicely. So here, here we are again. Um, you get an inside look at the joint right there. So just to orient everybody, those are the posterior tendons coming down um, behind the the medial malleolus, which is essentially gone. Um, those two K wires are transfixing the articular surface and you can see the dome of the talus right there. And we've got a nice slice of, of Taylor dome that I was talking about. And then the talonavicular dislocation is fixed with the, that little plate down there in the bottom half of the picture. So um, this is how I treated this. I put it in a ring fixator. And the, the reason why I did that was because it enabled me to control the length and be able to control the length after the fact, right? So I just told you guys that I've done cases where I fixed it and then I looked at it later and I was like, damn it, it's too short. I didn't do the right thing. It was comminuted. It was late. I had something going on later. I tried to catch a flight to go to Jeff's course or something like that. And um, I, I slacked off and didn't do the right thing. With the spatial frame, I could go back and dial in some length, which is oftentimes what I would do with something like this. So um, transfixation of the distal tibia of the plafond after articular reduction with screws don't let anybody tell you you can't mix screws and ring fixators. It's okay. I've been doing it for years. Nobody's come after me with a hatchet yet. Um, and so that way you've got a nice articular reduction and then you have control over the distal tibia and you can pull it down. The trick is don't control the distal fibula because then you can't do anything to the distal tibia. So the, the ring is all about the tibia only, not the fibula. And you guys can see there that I have um, a small plate and screws fixing that little fibula fracture there. The other thing that I did with this case was I left some room for the plastic surgeon to do his thing. So um, the other cool thing about using a spatial frame or an Ilazar office, is it hides everything. <laughs> so nobody can see really what you did until you take it off. Um, so you have to get a lot of x-rays just so you can see what you're doing. But there um, we've got a lateral and you can see that I put some screws across the plafond distally. And if you want to be critical, you could say, Tony, you blunted the joint a little bit. It's not a perfect mortise. Okay, fine. Um, fight me later about it. But yeah, I agree. It's, it's maybe a little bit um, uh, blunted there. But we did get the length back in the TV, which I think in this fracture is really important. And then we fixed all that crap in his foot. So... Here, what, what we did is we left some opening space. I knew that the plastic surgeon was going to get need a vascular pedicle proximal in the leg. So I left him some room up there with a, a 5 8 ring so they can work in that space and then um, put a flap over the distal end of the tibia. So I'm going to stop right there. And um, thank you guys for, for checking that out. And I'm interested in hearing thoughts, concerns. Thanks, Tony. I think, uh, you know, using frames for pilon fractures is uh, is challenging, um, but it, it works well when you got somebody who's skilled and thoughtful at it, like like that obviously was. So, James, do you have any any comments or questions? I, you know, I was actually trying to figure out what you were going to do because that is a really challenging injury, and and everything you said about the pitfalls of sort of mega internal fixation in those patients with traumatic wounds. Um, clearly he's uh, making decisions by getting on a motorcycle, even after trauma that he's, you know, probably going to be coming back later um, and at some point. And so that I think is a really elegant solution. Uh, I think your ability to change the 
forces and prevent some of the sort of late collapse that would be really common in that. And then to avoid having to go back under the flap is that's a really elegant solution that sort of addresses all the, the anxiety points for, for high energy open P lawns like that. My, my only comment would be that I, I would have had a pretty long conversation with that patient up front about amputation. It's based on the, the leap studies, mangled foot plus mangled tibia equals caca foot. But um, I, I can't imagine that somebody would have given him a better chance than you did there. So I think that uh, that looks looks good. Much obliged. Okay. Tony, did, Dr. Tony Will, did, you, that. did the did the plastic surgeons cuss you any less? It looks like it's still tough to work around. No, I mean, I, the plastic you told surgeon, him you helped a little, right? The plastic surgeon <laughs> that's done most of my flaps has made a fortune off of me. So he doesn't get to cuss me. But, um, and he, he's used to it because I, I am a ills are off dork. Right. So he's, I've given him a lot of cases like that over time. Um, and so he's gotten pretty used to it. And, and actually the selection about where I opened that ring was based on a conversation with him in advance. Awesome. Where, where that's a, that's a really to... key. That's the key point right there. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Yeah, I need to know what he need, what he needs. Um, so leave him space. Yeah, and one of the comments in the in the panelist discussion is talking number one about amputation like Jeff brought up and then the other one is uh, hind foot fusion, sort of acute fusion. And I think that's something to consider in an injury like this. Obviously you're gonna have intramedullary devices most of the time, although there's some plates. Um, motorcyclists are gonna hate that on the left side because that's their shifter foot. Although a stiff, a stiff hind foot, and it, Pilon and everything from a uh, fixator is not a whole lot more mobile than a fuse ankle, but probably probably gives them the understanding that it might be more mobile. So, yeah. 